Welcome uh, to the uh, IQA live session. My name is Sana, and I'll be uh, taking you guys through um, the introduction and the setup and the ground rules and introducing you to our uh, presenter. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, if not, uh, please uh, let me know in the chats. Uh, to communicate with us at any point, you can uh, definitely write a message in the chat or my name is Sana and if you want to send a private uh, question uh, or something about uh, you know, what the trainer is talking about on the screen, then you can send me a private message as well. So just to get started, thank you all for being here. Um, just a few brief ground rules. Uh, obviously, uh, keep writing your questions in the chat and don't worry about, uh, you know, if the trainer is not able to cover all your questions during the presentation, we will be having a Q&A session at the end as well. Uh, please note that anyone causing any kind of a disturbance will be removed from the session. And uh, we will try to keep it so that the questions are covered at the end. So uh, what we're covering in the session today is uh, focused around the level four internal quality assurance course, uh, as you know. Um, in the introduction of the course, we're going to be covering um, sectors, uh, job roles that you can apply, because usually we get a lot of questions around, um, you know, can I work as this or, uh, you know, what kind of a job can I do? So we're just going to cover that. We're going to cover previous versions of the course because as you know, the courses change over a period of time, and sometimes there's confusion around that, and also how it relates to the other education and training qualifications. So if you already have existing qualifications, um, what can you do? Are there any good combinations to do this with, uh, and so on? And uh, usually, I mean, we all know that we're working from home, and obviously, uh, during the current COVID-19 lockdown, um, you know, ELN operates uh, as a global company, and we have candidates all over the world, and different countries are at various stages of the lockdown. So a frequent question that we've been getting, uh, which we will definitely answer today, is how are we uh, going to observe and assess you uh, during this time of lockdown? And a lot of students have uh, questions around, you know, access to work-based evidence and how the uh, observations are going to happen. And Mark will cover that as well. Uh, and obviously, we will go through each course unit, what's required, um, uh, examples of evidence that you can give uh, for each unit and how it is assessed. Uh, obviously, in each section, we're going to be talking about how it's assessed. Uh, within ELN, but usually that is the case um, across the board. So our presenter for today is uh, Mark Bresland. Uh, Mark is our uh, training manager as well, and uh, wonderful experience. He's one of our most highly rated tutors, uh, five stars all around. You can check our reviews on Facebook, Google, and Trustpilot. Um, he supports the students on our Level 5D Diploma in Education and Training on the Level 4 IQA and the EQA courses. And sometimes he helps out with the assessor courses as well. He has over 23 years of training experience and, uh, you know, ha has been training online and offline pretty much um, across uh, Africa and Asia and Europe uh, and has uh, a lot of qualifications himself as well, including the DET. Um, Mark has also achieved the QTS and uh, is currently undergoing qualifications in e-learning, as well as having the LEAD IQA and EQA course. Mark is also an external verifier. So a lot of experience, and I'm sure you guys will benefit from it um, as he moves on. So without further ado, um, Mark, over to you. And uh, in the meantime, I'll keep an eye on the questions. Thank you, Thank Sana. You. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ELN uh, webinar. Just to get started, the intention of the next uh, 45 to 50 minutes will be to go through uh, some background information on the internal quality assurance units, all three, to be precise. Uh, and then we'll sort of delve into the, the finer details in terms of uh, uh, assessment criteria within each unit. And obviously relating to that assessment criteria will be questions relating to evidence uh, and probably more so these days and, and because obviously of the ongoing situation worldwide. So hopefully we'll, we'll clear up any, any gray areas and doubts, but also bear in mind that some questions 
we will need to most likely handle on a one-to-one -one basis because everyone's situation may be different. Okay, and again, it's all about ensuring that your end portfolio or potential portfolio will meet the warm bodies uh, requirements. Okay, so please bear that in mind that there's no golden rule as such for every single person, but certainly we'll do our utmost to ensure everyone uh, achieves what they need to achieve to complete their qualification. Right, so without further ado, what we'll cover today uh, is the following. Uh, some background information on the IQ Awards and Certificate. We'll then move on to sort of uh, go through each unit in turn and again bring out the specifics and relation to the units. And this will obviously include uh, evidence as well, uh, uh, what you'll need to submit, uh, even if you are a, a current learner or a potential learner that may be interested in registering on down the line. And then finally, at the very bottom, we'll see a remote evidence opportunities. So that's when we'll sort of go through what you can do in the interim period prior to perhaps you uh, taking up on a uh, IKEA roles actually within your centres, within your workplace. When you're at home, how can you make that time uh, constructive? So in terms of the three awards, around the three units, unit one, unit two, unit three. And you can see they're, they're color coded there. Unit one, which is the award in understanding the internal quality assurance of assessment processes and practice. Unit two, which is the award in internal quality assurance of assessment processes and practice. And unit three, which is a certificate in leading the internal quality assurance of assessment processes and practice. So all three units make up the certificate in internal quality assurance. If you're completing unit one and two, that'll basically just mean you'll pick up the award in internal quality assurance. The unit two adds on the extra dimension of you actually being able to uh, practically complete IKEA activities within your organization or within your workplace. Unit one, yep, is, is completely theory, but again, it's very useful for those who wish to sort of uh, increase their understanding of the process and perhaps down the line move into an IQA role. These qualifications have been around for a long time, believe it or not. Uh, the, the quality assurance uh, rationale has, has been in place in education for, for a number of years now. It's just changed names, uh, to be honest. Initially it was known as a D34 and most of D34 you had all our assessing units called D32, D33. It then moved into what was called the V1, and then this current form in 2013, it changed over to, to what you see today. Uh, on down the line, I think there was a review due to happen in November that's been put back, but in this form, IQA qualifications will continue. There's no doubt on that at all. All IQA is based around the IQA cycle. Okay, this is what sort of we use within the, the quality industry to ensure that uh, learners and assessors achieve what they want to achieve and, and, and standards and assessment is upheld throughout organizations and throughout centers. Uh, you can see there are five elements to the cycle and they all deal with the various elements contained within IQA. All these elements of the cycle are covered within the assessment criteria. More so in unit one initially. You're then expected to put this into practice in unit two and obviously lead the practice in unit three. In terms of the three units, you can see broadly how they sort of stack up against each other. So at the very top, you have got the level four award and understanding, as I mentioned before, the theory. And the second row down, you've got unit one and two, which allows you to practically complete IQ activities. Then the bottom row, which you see all three units together, which allows you to lead the quality assurance uh, package within your center. Each unit consists of learning outcomes and assessment criteria based at level four. And that's quite important to remember and understand, especially when you come on to complete your unit one assignments, because the standard of assignment will need to relate to a level four standard within the qualification framework uh, within the UK. This consists of, of 
elements as well as uh, explaining the answers. Uh, it'll include uh, research and it'll include ensuring you uh, give examples, hypothetical or otherwise, from your own practice, either on a one-to-one -one basis or something that you've maybe come across within your uh, career. As the first unit is purely knowledge-based, it can be taken prior to or at the time, uh, at the same time as the other units. So there's no requirement within the uh, unit, or sorry, award and body specification that says you need to complete unit one before you do anything else. You can complete it at the same time, for example, as you complete unit two. We would recommend, however, if you're new to quality assurance, a common sense approach would be to understand the processes and practices of IQA prior to moving into the practical role. So obviously unit one will be best practice to complete first prior to doing unit two. Uh, prerequisites of the qualifications. Again, everyone needs to be 19 plus. Uh, core skills themselves, there's no formal entry requirements for the training course. However, we do expect that candidates must have sufficient reading and writing skills in order to complete the course. Obviously, you, you will need access to internet using a laptop, PC or tablet, and obviously using an up-to-date Windows, Android or Apple operating system. Very importantly for Unit 2, you will need that access to two assessors who each have access to being able to assess two of their own learners. And again, that's very important for Unit 2. In terms of Unit 3, again, you will need access to at least two other internal verifiers who in turn have access to two other assessors themselves. This requirement, again, is essential for Level 3 because it makes the whole quality assurance uh, process authentic, current, valid, sufficient, and reliable. Those are the key words that you need to keep in the back of your head, especially when you're completing the units and you're submitting evidence, because there's no simulations allowed as such within unit two and three. So everything needs to have that authenticity. And this is the way we sort of we sort of police that and ensure. So let's get into unit one. So unit one, as I mentioned before, consists of one knowledge unit, which is called the understanding the principles and practices of internal, internally assuring the quality of assessment. And as mentioned before, it can be taken by anyone, whether they're quality assuring or not. I mean, we do find a lot of managers, administrators, supervisors, and potential IQAs like taking this qualification because it gives them an insight into what their staff should and can be doing in terms of IQA. There's a total of six learning outcomes in the knowledge unit. And these outcomes range from the context and principles of IQA, goes on to how to plan the IQA of assessment, goes on then to discuss techniques and criteria for monitoring the quality of assessment, how to internally maintain and improve the quality of assessment, how to manage information which is relevant to the IQA of assessment. And finally, it finishes off with legal and good practice requirements for the internal quality assurance assessment. All learning outcomes have assessment criteria, obviously, relating to them. And again, that's where it gets into the, the finer details again. In terms of uh, evidence, as I mentioned briefly before, it being a level four course, you are required to complete a series of assignment based answers. The questions of which are mapped across to the learning outcomes and the assessment criteria. You're encouraged other than the actual assignment answers to also include supplementary evidence, which is sourced from your own practice and also research, which you can complete online or obviously by, by your reading books as well. Not all research needs to be done online. Of course, you can, you can go back to the other system as well. If you're not currently a practice in IQA, which in, in, in probably most cases, those completing the unit one are not, 
hypothetical examples can be used. Uh, and again, this can be in the form of policies, procedures, which perhaps you've sourced online, uh, IKEA sample and documentation, which is sourced online, and perhaps even more probably uh, relating to yourself, your CPD record. All those are examples of information which you can use. Obviously, there are certain stipulations relating to online research in terms of plagiarism. We take a very dim view, obviously, of plagiarism. It goes against our own ethos and that of the awarding organization. So we're very strict in terms of this. We must make sure all of your work is of your own being in terms of written and also research as well. As we mentioned, level four research is required. Okay, so just be careful when you do complete, or if you're completing these types of questions, that you cite your sources correctly, and you include all your research material as you would expect to see yourself if you were reading from a textbook, okay? As I said before, there's no issue with research. I said, in fact, you need to have research. You just need to be careful which way you transfer this onto your written text. Uh, feedback. Once you actually upload your documentation onto our ePortfolio, it is given uh, upon receipt. And we've got quite a quick turnaround on our feedback. It's usually done within the working week in 48 hours. Obviously, we do have public holidays and times of uh, we get extremely busy, but 99% of the time you will receive your feedback within that golden turnaround period. Unit two. So unit two, uh, again, lateral qualification relates to is the level four award and in the internal quality assurance of assessment processes and practices. A combination of which obviously is unit one and unit two. Unit two is a practical implementation of you completing IQ activities within your center or organization. This will include sample planning, monitoring of assessors on the records, advising and supporting assessors, talking to learners and witnesses, and checking and maintaining records. Again, this uh, award, as I mentioned before, combines both the knowledge with the performance. So as I mentioned earlier on, it is quite important to have that sound, sufficient understanding of the process prior to jumping in and doing unit two. In terms of learning outcomes, again, some of these you will, you will hear me mention them before, but you need to achieve the planning of AQA. Uh, internally evaluate the quality of assessment, internally maintain and improve the quality of assessment, manage information relevant to the internal quality assurance of assessment, and finally, maintain legal and good practice requirements when internally monitoring and maintaining the quality of assessment. All those learning objectives, learning outcomes you need to achieve, okay? Now, there's various ways of doing this, Okay, and again, obviously, it's going to relate around the specific industry, your expertise, which way we, we, we can do that. Okay. In terms of summarizing what you need to do, you need to have access to two assessors. Each assessor needs to have two learners each. With each assessor, you need to complete two IQA sampling activities. And again, the award and body is quite strict and the Education and Training Foundation are quite strict into what these sampling activities are. The first activity is an observation of assessment practice, which includes questioning. Not to insult anybody's intelligence, observation is actually direct face-to-face -face observing the assessor completing some form of assessment with a particular learner. The second IQ activity is a review of the assessor's work product. And what I mean by work product is anything which the assessor has produced during the course of an assessment over perhaps a qualification or program of learning. 
what the IQA is responsible for doing, obviously apart from the planning, is to sample perhaps a learner's portfolio. You could sample or she could sample the learner's uh, documentation relating to an assessment. For example, a lot of awarding bodies in first aid, health and safety, have their own specific assessment documentation that the assessor needs to complete. If I was an IQA, I would review that documentation to ensure that the assessor has met all the awarding body's stipulations in terms of completion of detail, all the boxes ticked, all the I's crossed, etc. Okay, so that's what we mean by a review of the assessor's work product. Additional performance evidence, okay, is required also. And in fact, encourage it because what it does, it expands your own understanding and knowledge as well of the quality assurance process. Additional information such as learner interviews. And this type of thing is what you're doing is trying to ascertain the learner's point of view in terms of the assessment process. It is not a finger pointing exercise at the actual assessor. It's getting another uh, line of feedback from a different angle. So perhaps moving forward, the quality of assessment within a particular center can be approved. Not always the case, but certainly another angle which should be uh, explored. Actual performance evidence. Okay, so what I mean by performance evidence is hard evidence that you've completed your IPA sampling activities. And again, Away back at the start, I mentioned the VACSR, the valid, authentic, current, sufficient, reliable. Keep that in your mind, okay? So in terms of planning, what you would expect to uh, submit would be initially an IQA observation plan. And what an observation plan is, is really a, a series of dates uh, and predicted dates in the future, obviously, where you as an IQA would potentially and plan to complete those one-to-one -one observations of the assessor completing that assessment practice. Sampling and tracking sheet. And again, this can be combined with the observation plan. It really depends what way you want to approach it and indeed what you're currently doing perhaps within your own center. However, a sampling and tracking sheet basically tracks the learners with each assessor. It also details perhaps what units or what parts of the qualification you as an IQA wish to sample throughout a particular course, a qualification, or program of learning. As a good IQA, you're not always going to sample the same elements of a program or qualification. It doesn't make any sense and it doesn't give you a balanced outlook of how your assessors are performing and indeed how your learners are responding to assessment. So that sample and tracking sheet is very useful for again, for projecting and planning what, when, and how you're going to complete that sampling. And the good thing about sampling and tracking sheets and indeed sampling uh, this type of thing, it can be done remotely. So for example, if a learner's portfolio uh, was, was through the process of interim sampling. And what that basically means was halfway through the program of learning and the IQA had identified uh, a particular date to sample a particular learner. He could request from the assessor or from their own e-portfolio, the portfolio of the learner, which he can then or she can then sample and then give feedback based on that particular sample. So. Bear that in mind for your evidence that the product evidence of the assessor can be done remotely. Okay, it's quite easy to do that. Moving on, other uh, bits of evidence to consider would be an assessor evaluation. So part of your planning process, as well as uh, projecting your dates you're going to sample, you also need to include how you're going to evaluate lateral assessors. And what we mean by that is doing your due diligence ensuring that the assessors are properly qualified and experienced within that particular subject to complete the assessments. Now, again, a lot of the time, if you're working full-time with a center, you most likely are going to know the assessors on a first name basis anyway. However, 
for the uh, sake of the qualification, IQA qualification, complete this part because it does show again that you're considering all planning aspects and you're completing that due diligence and ensuring that this assessor is actually competent to complete that assessment. Because if they're not, uh, it'll eliminate a lot of issues that may pop up on down the line in terms of your results from your sampling. Other evidence in terms of when you're actually doing the IQA sampling is an assessor observation checklist, one for each assessor. And all this is, is a series of criteria which you've either A, got from the awarding body's qualification stipulation, or B, perhaps your centre's policies procedures, or even VACSR. Okay, so as long as you're completing your quality assurance against some form of criteria which is recognised and smart in nature. Okay. On the obstacle observation checklist, as well as the criteria, could be perhaps a series of checkboxes where you are actually watching the assessor, making sure they fulfill each of that criteria. All around the checkboxes, all around obvious inclusions include feedback. Okay, so again, that written feedback is very important. I, I know we always give verbal feedback as well. However, a recorded written feedback also needs to be included. Learner interview, as I mentioned before. Again, this can be a form of a document, a checklist document, where you have a series of questions that you're going to ask that particular learner. And the secret behind good quality assurance interviews, whether with a learner or whether with an assessor, is to make it sound like a conversation and not a interrogation as such. You will get a lot more information, viable information from uh, your, your, your colleagues and learners in relation to quality assurance if you do it that way. And again, please remember, let's not based as a finger pointing exercise, it's purely to get another angle, another perspective of the assessment process. IKA report, which again is very useful because what it does, other than all the other documentation, is can summarize what you've done with that particular assessor. So for example, if I completed on Monday an observation of assessment with some questions, and they also managed to sample the assessment records of that particular assessor. I would take my find, obviously discuss my findings with the assessor through a one-to-one -one feedback session. I would then go home and then I would then formulate a IQA report. And that IQA report would basically detail my findings, what actually I sampled. That would include my findings in terms of what I thought of the actual evidence, VACSR. And that report would then go to the assessor based on that sampling. That's the best practice because the assessor needs to get eyes on the feedback as well. Obviously, it's not a one-way process. You need to give the assessors that opportunity to return the feedback to you. That's very important. Feedback in itself, and again, I won't preach to you about feedback, but the two golden words within feedback is motivational and developmental. That's the two words that you need to keep in your mind at all times, whenever you're giving feedback to anyone, not just assessors, but also learners as well. Everybody needs that motivation. Everybody needs perhaps that guidance and support to better themselves and better lateral assessment practice as well. Additional evidence within unit two, and again, this is to strengthen your portfolio is actual learner and assessor samples from your organization and center. Obviously, again, this is dependent on GDPR and sensitivity. Okay, but basically what this is a strengthening your portfolio to ensure that it is authentic. Okay, but again, we can discuss that type of thing as and when you need to discuss, okay. Standardization. Very important within quality assurance. Uh, and again, standardization within the last two to three years has, has sort of been shoved to the, to the very front of quality assurance and assessment. In fact, uh, it's very important. And the evidence you'll be required to do within unit two will be to either attend 
a standardization meeting or drive some sort of standardization activity. Now there's numerous types of standardization which you can complete, okay? I mentioned one, which is an actual meeting with assessors, where you can perhaps discuss uh, the previous qualification, the previous course that was delivered. It can be a standardization of assessment documentation, policies, procedures. There's a lot you can standardize, there's a lot you can use as evidence. So other than perhaps a meeting agenda, you can show evidence of you driving an actual assessment wrong, a standardization activity. What else we need? Criteria. Yeah, use for basing judgments on. So even though you've got your documentation relating to your observations, we would also need to see what actually you're basing it on. And this can be anything from your IQA rationale, an actual strategy, your award and organization qualification specification, anything that'll point towards why you're doing this quality assurance. Okay, criteria, again, is a big one because what we're trying to eliminate, obviously across the industry, is people not just doing quality assurance off the cuff five minutes after dreaming it up. That's not fair on assessors. It's not fair on learners. It needs to be standardized. It needs to be thorough and detailed. In terms of the observation details for Unit 2, all or land all your performance evidence, which you mentioned, which needs to be VA CSR. And main ways you can VA CSR your documentation is ensuring it is the actual documentation that you used for your sampling activities. All documentation should be properly dated, signed, and countersigned. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, it's not always possible given everybody's environments and which the quality insurer, because a lot of quality insurers do work in the virtual online environment where signatures don't happen. Okay, but again, that is something that we can discuss on a one-to-one -one basis as and when it happens, because there are other ways around it, such as email proof, e-signatures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so don't worry about it needn't having to be a wet signature. Not always the case. In terms of observation, this is again very strict because we need to see and ensure that the assessor is both current and competent within the ratio uh, ability to complete uh, the right key activities. And what we've chosen is, uh, is a feedback session. And basically what will happen or what would happen after you've completed your uh, observation of the assessment practice, as you would do normally, you would take those assessors one at any one time, obviously, and give good motivational developmental feedback based on what you've observed, okay? That session can be videoed, and the video would then be sent to yourselves, ELN, using Dropbox, Google Drive, or another media. And then the ELN assessor would then observe that video and complete a report, which would then be entered into your portfolio and used as evidence to support Unit 2. We do have other options. Other than the video, we can do live online observations as well. And what I mean by that is perhaps you giving feedback to your assessors with your ELN assessor actually online through the webcam, observing you complete that feedback session and actually completing the report live as it happens. Option three, if you have a colleague who is competent and current. And those two words basically competent in terms of they have the internal quality assurance qualification already. In terms of current, they are and do complete quality assurance as part of their everyday uh, work and responsibilities. They can actually be approved by ourselves to complete that observation on our behalf. Now the process for that is stringent, as I'm sure you can appreciate it. Uh, what we need to see in all cases is their CV showing their currency, their qualifications showing their competency, and then we will get in touch with 
the uh, colleague and uh, have a quick discussion and just basically satisfy ourselves that they meet all the criteria for that actual feedback session. Okay, so moving on to unit three. So unit three, uh, and again, I'll, I'll take you slightly back, consists of three units. Sorry, I beg your pardon. There we go. Uh, unit one, which is knowledge. Unit two, which you're after discussing. And then obviously unit three, which is the planning, allocating, and monitoring of work in your own area of responsibility. This makes up the whole certificate. Okay, so you need to achieve all three units to achieve the certificate. And again, the stipulations are quite stringent in terms of what role you're currently or intending to do within your organization or center. The certificate is designed for, for those who lead the internal quality assurance process within a center organization and actually have the responsibility for managing the quality of the assessment process, practice, and performance all of assessors and all our IQAs. All our IQAs is the key one here. You need at least that access to two all our IQAs who each have at least two assessors. All the responsibilities of a lead IQA are, are, are numerous, including developing uh, internal quality assurance systems and coordinating visits from uh, external quality assurers. What this unit does, it combines the knowledge with the two performance units. Okay, so again, there is performance evidence required for this unit. There's a total of four learning outcomes. And again, I would, I would split this down. I would say this is most likely a 70% theory, 30% practical uh, evidence-based unit. So in terms of learning outcomes, you've got to initially produce a work plan for your own area of responsibility. You need to allocate and agree responsibilities with your team members. You're to monitor the progress and quality of work in your own area of responsibility and also provide feedback and review and amend plans of work for your own area of responsibility and then communicate those changes to your colleagues. To summarize, those four learning outcomes and what you need to do. Initially, for the first learning outcome, you'll go into quite a lot of detail on what your role and responsibility is within your work environment. What your organization consists of, what qualifications you deliver, you assess. You'll also discuss who your IQA team are. And again, without crossing any boundaries in terms of GDPR, you will be expected to submit evidence in terms of who your IQAs actually are in terms of uh, details, qualifications, etc. From this initial theory-based uh, explanation, you will then be uh, required to complete a work plan. Now, a work plan sounds a lot worse than it really is, okay? All the work plan is for is really a lead IQA sets out their series of tasks that they want to complete throughout any given period. Okay. And again, this could be quite simple in content. And we do obviously in ELN provide where we can and where practical uh, templates which will help you and guide you along this process. We are not expecting you to be uh, fully competent within the subject prior to taking a qualification. It is a learning process throughout, so please don't be thinking that you would have all this at your fingertips. We will help you along that way, okay? So the work plan, as I mentioned, will detail what you intend to do or plan to do with the center in terms of IQA. You'll then move on to uh, designating tasks to your other team members. And team members, I'm, I'm chatting here in terms of your other IQAs. And again, these tasks, again, are numerous because uh, you're basically allocating and designating tasks such as analyzing appeals and complaints, uh, arranging training, CPD, arranging standardization, marketing and advertising, 
uh, even managing budgets and audits. There's numerous uh, tasks that the lead AQA can designate. Now, I know obviously these will vary according to center and organization, and we will be realistic in terms of what evidence you can produce. Okay, the main thing is to ensure that you fully understand how to complete the role on completion of your qualification. That's obviously the, the end result. Moving on from the actual designation of tasks, you then need to agree uh, responsibilities with the actual uh, colleagues uh, through SMART. And again, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, all in the form of objectives. And this is where the observation comes in. So what we will require is a observation evidence of you completing a meeting with your other IQAs and discussing those uh, identified activities in terms of tasks and the responsibilities which you're sh sharing with your colleagues. Okay, what the meeting will do will it will clearly state all your points within your work plan, who you're given what rules and responsibilities to, and then agreeing some form of time frame of how you're going to actually evaluate. Uh, that work. Now, evaluation can take uh, different avenues, different evidence can cover this, such as minutes of meetings, it can be copies of staff appraisals, it can be action target points. So there's numerous ways you can evidence this, but the observation, that meeting observation, gives you the opportunity to evidence quite a lot of assessment criteria purely by having that meeting, okay, by uh, designating tasks agreeing smart activities, getting feedback from your colleagues, and then pressing on, okay? So again, I do hasten to add this, this webinar will give you a broad overview of the unit and qualifications. When you have that specific chat with your assessor uh, prior to completing the course, it'll be explained in more detail, okay? So please don't uh, be too concerned about if, if some things here completely uh, over your head as such. Moving on down through the learning objectives, uh, finally, review and amend work plans within your own area of responsibility. And all this deals with is basically a change happening to your program within your plan. That could be, for example, an EQA visit being rescheduled to perhaps being completed remotely, or just a change in date, which you've had to adapt to. And how would you actually communicate these changes via email? And evidence of that, yep, you've guessed it, is an actual email of you uh, given those changes to your colleagues. All right, so say people look at the certificate in AQA, it is not unachievable whatsoever. It is very straightforward. It is, as it says, 70% theory, 30% practical, and it can be done, providing obviously you have those resources, as in your assessors and your AQAs. All the assessment criteria for all three units will be thoroughly explained prior, before you begin a qualification. If you're experienced, by all means, yeah, you, you can listen, but uh, we do recommend you take all the advice that we give. So in terms of uh, remote evidence opportunities, so when I, when I mentioned the word remote, okay, basically remote is you can complete this type of evidence from, from anywhere, really, okay? And obviously the, the IQA of the assessment can be completed or should be completed direct, but in some cases completed remotely as well. As we mentioned in unit two, you can remotely sample the assessor's work product. Just to sort of refresh your memories, that is perhaps a particular learner's portfolio. What you want to sample can be emailed to you. You can review it and then send back feedback via uh, a, a email or, in fact, over Zoom, GoToMeeting, Teams, whichever you want to use. Okay, so again, that's that's quite an easy one which you can do with your assessors. Learner interviews, again. This is quite a useful one to do for unit two, where you can arrange to call the learners, 
and again go through that checklist which I discussed earlier on, those those questions but are not questions, if that makes sense, your discussion with the learner to try and get that alternative perspective on the assessment process. How do you how would you evidence it? You still evidence through the report. Standardization, again, standardization more and more is being completed remotely anyway, regardless of you doing a course or not. So a meeting through again Zoom, go to meeting, Skype, etc. You can facilitate your two other assessors, your other uh, IQAs, and discuss the standardization topic or go through the standardization activity. Obviously, evidence for this again, no change from doing directly. You would have an agenda, you would keep minutes. All that is evidence that you've completed that form of uh, evidence for unit two. Feedback to assessors in unit two. So again, this can be completed remotely as well. For example, again, using a, a tool, such as GoToMeeting, Skype, Zoom, you can facilitate a meeting with each of your assessors and discuss and go through the observation, the review of learners' work with them. That can then be recorded. It can be sent to us and that can be used again to complete a report based on that. Okay, now again, in terms of remote, if you were doing that remotely, you'd need to record that particular session of feedback with your assessors, okay, or with your IQAs. That session would again be observed by your ELN assessor who would then complete a report based on that. The obvious other alternative is to uh, share the meeting with your ELN assessor as well. So again, they can actually sit in on that online meeting and complete the report as it happens. In terms of lead IQA unit three, the smart meeting, as I've already mentioned, can be completed, facilitated online also. Okay, so a matter of your arranging with the other IQAs uh, a time and a date, and again, would need to be recorded if it's not going to involve the actual ELN assessor, or you can include the ELN assessor also. Now, don't forget the other requirement which you can use as the approved person which can actually observe the lead IQA meeting or the feedback to assessor as well. That's a competent and current person which we discussed was your third option. Okay, I hope I haven't confused anyone there. But again, I'm sure we can, we can clear anything up uh, uh, at, at the end. So in terms of remote evidence and, and COVID-19, now we, we've had guidance from the warden body because believe it or not, the warden body find themselves in a bit of predicament as well, okay, in terms of what direction they wanted to go. But we ourselves at ELN have been since we started a online learning provider and we did uh, make the most of remote sampling activities and remote assessment by ourselves. So by and large, our processes haven't changed as such, but I'm sure you can appreciate not everybody's case is going to be exactly the same. So we need to, with that in mind, if you're wondering about certain remote opportunities, which you can complete as part of your IQA qualification, that can be done on a one-to-one -one basis. Okay, and again, we can get into the specifics of what actually you mean in terms of what evidence you can produce, when it was produced, uh, if it was previous, or if it's moving forward. But again, we need to be stringent and we need to be sure of the exact evidence before we make any decisions. And decisions are not always the same in every case. Okay. But with all that said, we are very flexible in terms of our approach. We're all very IT savvy, we like to think. So we can look at ways of making sure you can still complete the qualification and still achieve your desired result, which is perhaps a, a, a promotion or, or leading on to a brand new uh, career path. Okay, so certainly we will do everything and work with it. In terms of registration periods in COVID-19, 
uh, as again we've already stated that we shall work with everybody who is registered with ELN and ensure and protect the registration parade whilst this uh, ongoing situation we make sure you will achieve your, your your qualification so please don't be concerned that for example if your registration parade finishes in july we will work with you to ensure that at the soonest opportunity you're able to complete that okay so please don't worry about it so to to summarize uh Again, this was just only a brief introduction on all three units. Uh, speaking from personal experience, the IQA qualification is invaluable. If you're interested in quality assurance at all, you will find it very interesting and worthwhile. It can transfer across a number of different sectors and industries. Uh, and if you've got a good eye for detail, yeah, a good eye for detail, you'll certainly, certainly enjoy it. Uh, and again, as I've said several times, the ELN assessor will work with you at all times to ensure and guide you to the correct evidence and making sure you meet and tick all those boxes in terms of the assessment criteria. We don't work a pass fail straight away. Okay, we give everyone, everyone full opportunity to meet the assessment criteria. We guide them 100% along the way our assessors at all times are available email, on the phone, online, on Smartsheet or e or e portfolio at all times. Okay, so please bear that in mind that we're here to support and ensure you achieve everything you want to achieve. So what I'll do now, I'm going to hand you back to Sana. Uh, uh, okay, hi Mark. Thank you, Sana. So thank you very much. That was very informative and you have covered uh, a lot of the points. So there has been uh, a lot of interest in various aspects. So uh, we don't have much time remaining. Uh, what I'll do is I'll keep the questions snappy um, so that we can cover most of them. Uh, can you uh, please just explain quickly what do you mean by VACSR? VACSR is valid, authentic, current, sufficient, reliable. It's the five key ingredients all assessors and all IQA will use as criteria. Assessors will use it when, when they're judging their evidence of the learners, and IQAs will use it for when they're judging the standard of assessment. Okay, brilliant. And that is in the course materials for the IQA Seven course, in case it's yeah. once over it. Okay. Um, so there, most of the... Uh, Let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, like Mark said, I've just got a question through about deadlines. Um, due to Corona and obviously getting all the, um, you know, evidence together, there is uh, going to be, uh, you know, we understand that you might need a bit of extra time. So with regards to deadlines or, uh, you know, if you have individual circumstances, I would say probably best to just speak directly with your tutor uh, on a one-to-one -one, uh, because deadlines or extensions we actually deal with on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, rather than have, uh, if any of you would like to have a one-to-one -one after straight after the session, Mark will be available for half an hour. I can arrange five to ten minute one-to-one uh, -one sessions. Please send me your email address in a private chat, and I can set up the ten-minute session with you one-to-one. -one. So in my private chat, please send your emails, and I can uh, set up a, like quick five-minute sessions one-to-one. -one. Uh, okay, so uh, Mark, there's been a lot of questions about actual uh, remote assessment, and I think uh, they came at the beginning, and I hope that most of, you know, uh, the people who were asking the questions, I hope, uh, guys, you, your um, questions got covered. Uh, Mark did cover that slide on remote uh, assessment. You can basically include sampling, uh, you know, learner interview, a feedback to an assessor, or even a standardization meeting. Basically, the point is that we have to observe you at least once, um, and that does have to be recorded. Uh, Mark, can you just uh, clarify quickly, what do you mean by standardization and what are the methods? Yeah, standardization was brought in to assessment and quality assurance to ensure that everyone across the board uh, in terms of an organization was singing off the same song sheet as it were that all standards of assessment were the same that assessors were marking learners work 
exactly the same. Uh, so that's basically what standardization is. Uh, and again, that, that'll, that'll filter into things such as policy procedures, uh, making all resources exactly the same. Uh, I mean, activities which you can complete a standardization, uh, you've got observations of assessors by the AQA, second marking, double blind assessment. Uh, but meetings as, as a generally uh, considered to be one of the most effective methods of standardization. So you've got the assessors in the one location with perhaps the AQA or center, center manager, and you're making sure that everybody prior to a program of learning understands the correct assessment strategy. They understand what the actual qualification specification. So that's hopefully able to understand now that it needs to be benchmarked. All assessment needs to be benchmarked and it needs to be benchmarked at a high level, which ensures the credibility of a qualification and the credibility of their own organization meets that of the award and organization, including regulators such as Ofqual. Okay, yep, great. So um, there, there's another question about a remote assessment. So one question was, can we actually give written evidence instead of uh, the video? Uh, you know, what would you like to say about that? And then obviously, if you can just speak a little bit about the authorized person who can observe. Yep. Uh, in short, no, it's, it's, very, it's very stringent. And uh, this isn't just from the warden body. The overall regulating document is and, and, and body is the Education and Training Foundation, and they handle all education and training qualifications, including that of assessment and uh, quality assurance. Now, they're quite strict that we need to observe you complete that particular task as an assessor, as an IQA. Okay, so that's, there's no way of getting around it. Written statements, professional discussions will certainly be considered, but they won't instead of an observation I'm afraid uh, okay so yeah it has to be an uh, observation and what about uh, if they can get an authorized uh, person by all means as I mentioned earlier on the authorized person needs to be uh, approved prior by ourselves and that authorized person needs to be competent needs to be current and those two words keep in your mind competent uh, they have the same qualification, they have an AQA qualification which meets the same standard or above which you're completing and currency in terms of a CV which uh, evidences that they are a current perhaps AQA themselves or have recent AQA experience uh, within your field. But again, I hasten to add that there may be occasions it's not always going to be the case. Okay, so we will carry out due diligence and ensure that they meet our own approval uh, benchmarking system as well. But listen, we, we, we do this sort of thing every day, so it's not to say, if you have any doubts, ask. That will be my advice. Okay, great. 